Well, welcome and thank you for joining us, everybody. My name is Dwayne Henderson. I'm a member of Cree Lighting's training and education team and host of our e-learning series. For those watching live, happy Friday and I guess happy May. We've made it into the month of May. Quickly about the sessions, uh, once we get started, we'll have roughly 15 minutes of content. Uh, the presenter, in this case, Chris, today will hang on um, after the presentation for some Q&A. So although the participants are muted, we do encourage you to use either the chat box or the Q&A box to ask questions and feel free to type those during the presentation. We'll uh, circle back and, and answer those at the end of the presentation. As you know, Friday is controls related content. And for those that have been watching regularly, you've heard the, the letters API come up in a couple of the previous sessions. So to look more closely into that topic um, and to take us under the hood of uh, software and APIs, I'd like to welcome back Chris Evans. Good morning, Chris. Hey, good morning, Duane. Before we get started, you want to just remind the, the group real quickly about your role in the business? Uh, yeah, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. So I work in, on our intelligent lighting division, specifically under our uh, IoT group. So I work uh, on our product lines like SmartCast and Odyssey and, and mainly more on kind of uh, typically the non-lighting systems like our software and, and similar products. So um, everything from building new materials to uh, looking at uh, what new products may, uh, may be coming up next. So, yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? All right. Thanks again. And uh, yeah, so uh, under the hood of software and APIs. So um, so I think when you hear the word software, everybody gets a, gets an idea of what that is in, in your head. So we want to explore that a little bit further to really help us understand our products. And you know, software is all around us all the time. Some of us use it more than others. And, and sometimes we're probably using it and we don't even really realize it. Um, everything from your smartphone to even your flip phone, if you've still got one of those hanging on out there, uh, to your TV, your car, uh, and even even more so uh, your kitchen appliances. And and software really adds a lot of value uh, either to our lives or um, or even to the products that that we sell directly. And and not only does it exist on pretty much every LED fixture sold in in one way, shape, or form, but um, it's central to what drives, you know, our, even our most high-tech products. Um, so understanding software and how it relates to the to our products really can help us not only perform our job more effectively, um, but also uh, more efficiently as well. So, so here we go. Quick crash course in software and APIs and what drives it. So first off, to kind of lay the groundwork, let's just let's just set the stage and, and define what is software. So as we think of software, it's really just a collection of data, information, instructions uh, that basically helps a computer, a computer or its hardware perform a specific task. Um, and without software, a computer or any, uh, you know, somewhat smart device would, would basically be useless. So, um, so really software is just a collection of information or data. Uh, this could be anything from text-based code, uh, probably a whole lot of that to, uh, to images or graphics. And uh, you've probably heard of lines of code being mentioned before. And really lines of code is just telling a, a, a computer or a software program uh, what to do to execute a, a certain process. Uh, and you may have heard of Python or C++ or Java as a few examples of, of coding languages. Um, and really the other big piece of software is its interface or its graphical interface. And uh, you know, we don't want to sit there and just read lines of code all day. So, so we've got to uh, develop a user-friendly system in order to be able to interact effectively with software. And, um, you know, those of us who were playing with computers 30 or so years ago may remember the uh, MS-DOS interface. You know, we used to have to type very specific commands into a very text-based text interface in order to tell it what you wanted it to do or what program you wanted to launch. And We've come a really long way uh, to today with Windows 10 and um, and other operating modern operating systems and, and very graphic uh, and image rich um, interfaces that are just much more intuitive and, and natural for us as humans to interact with. So, um, so just kind of uh, wrap your head around on kind of what it helps us do. So. So, uh, so what's required for software? Well, pretty easy, a computer. And uh, computers can take a lot of shapes and forms, but um, typically, you know, we probably are gonna think of a laptop or some sort of tower-based uh, computer. And a computer is essentially a collection of hardware. So a variety of different physical components that are gonna allow that computer to, to basically run software. That's, that's ultimately the goal we're using it for. 
Um, so the big pieces here, and, and this is you're going to find these these uh, components not only in, in computers, but you know many of them also in our light fixtures themselves. Everything from processors, which are you know the the brain of the system, to to actually file storage drives or or power supplies, um, but ultimately uh, you know in some way to interface with it. So you can't just take that tower and do something with it. You got to hook up a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse. You know, increasingly we're using microphones to talk to our computers or our phones um, or other devices. So, so a variety of different ways we can we can do that as well. But you know, these all come together and give us a, a device that we can use to to operate software, uh, to check our email, um, to run a an internet browser, or, or maybe work on an Excel file. Um, so yeah. So so as we look at computers themselves, you know, one principle that's uh, you've probably heard reference before is is Moore's law, and most sim simplified, it's it's basically the concept that uh, the processing power of computers and in, in the component technology in computers will double every two years, and uh, and you can see some examples of technology progression here. If you're, you know, I'm sure some of you remember playing uh, Amazon Trail or some of the early floppy disk games on a Mac back in the day. Uh, to, uh, to you know, our mo a modern, much more sleek style of system to to modern smartphones, and I'm sure some of you have heard reference to our uh, our, our smartphones and how much more powerful they are today, even th than the rocket ship that that first landed humans on the on the moon. So uh, so we've come a really long way in regards to this technology, and and this this principle of Moore's law not only makes our computers uh, much more powerful exponentially over time, but it also helps shrink in physical size uh, those components and to give an example um, you, you got a you know probably a pretty typical computer I know I had one on, on one of my desks back in the day that looked just like this one and and uh, you may even have one still today that resembles a Dell like this and and today we can get all of those components needed on on what we call a single board computer and an example you may have heard of is is raspberry a raspberry pi that essentially an all-in-one self-contained computer on that little board that's roughly to scale. It actually, I think, is probably even tinier in scale to that desktop PC uh, in this image, but uh, all of that for a $35 price tag. And you actually have a small computer that you can load an operating system onto, like, uh, like a Linux or, an, or a Windows even, and actually interface with it. So it just goes to show you the power that we can get into small packages now. Um, and not only you know reach parts of the world with computer technology that may have not been able to to get it before, but also develop some really cool new products um, as we're able to get them into tighter, smaller, and and still m very powerful form factors. Um, so how does this all apply to lighting? So as we look at lighting, there's several uh, you know a couple different ways we can think about it. First are the embedded components we have in our fixtures. So LED drivers are, are actually, you know, some of them today pretty intelligent and have programmability. Um, it can do a wide variety of things, but for the most part, they're regulating power, possibly controlling color temperature um, and, and other factors within the system to even connecting to, to networks directly or, or sensor systems. Um, you know, we take it an, another step further and, and we might implement devices like a wireless radio module uh, into the fixture to even onboard sensor modules. To get to generate data, so we can actually do things like, hey, the room's occupied. Let's turn the lights on. Um, and now today we're getting, uh, you know, to where we can take all of that type of technology and again look at how Moore's laws helped us to, you know, move that into a much smaller package like these all-in-one modules we're starting to put into our uh, into our new new SmartCast products and other products um, where we get all of that in that nice little small form factor. Um, that's even more powerful than the larger units that we that we were using before. Um, and we've also got standalone, you know, computing hardware. So everything from touchscreen interfaces that that help run scene control or other types of programs to, to, you know, mobile applications that we can actually run on anybody's personal device that we're all carrying in our pocket uh, to, to lighting servers, which is just a you know fancy word for a computer. You know, a computer that's dedicated to running software just for the lighting system, uh, to, to gateways of different sorts that help us to either you know establish different types of networks like a wire, maybe a wireless network, or or even bridge networks together. 
Um, so we've got a wide variety of computing uh, components that, that go into our, our products today. We can do all different types of things with this. You know, a lot, you've probably already thought of, you know, at least one thing that comes to mind when you think of software and lighting. Uh, you know, this is a pretty typical example of a dashboarding system that gives us different types of analytics, either about the system itself um, or about our building space. It may even help us get more rebate dollars from our utility companies if we can report energy uh, on, on that performance. Um, to connecting into building automation systems. You know, that's a topic we'll explore more next week uh, in the Friday session uh, to, to some really advanced applications with, with the Internet of Things or IoT. Um, and, then, and then you've probably also heard firmware, and that's a specific type of software. So I thought it'd be interesting to, to, you know, at the level we do talk about firmware, you know, what the heck is it? Um, so firmware is, is a, basically it is a type of software, but it, instead of being one that you interact with, um, it's semi-permanently installed on a device and it stays there. And it's basically made to allow that device to interact uh, uh, with uh, or to, to operate without any human interaction. Um, so the, the example we could point to here is, is, is in our SmartCast system, we, we load firmware into our little RF modules and that allows those light fixtures to, you know, without a human needing to tell it, we can tell it, hey, you know, we want you to time out after 10 minutes of no activity from these sensors. And, and I can do that without any opera op or interaction from, from a human. So, um, so that's what firmware is and how it fits in, into this picture. Um, so, so the other big thing here is an API. And we, we did cover this, uh, you know, as Dwayne pointed out in a, in a couple of our previous sessions, but an API is, is, stands for Application Programming Interface. And this is basically a set of instructions that, that tell a, um, a computer to, or a, a software developer how to access different parts of a system. So um, it allows them to create programs that control the features of a device, an application, or some other service. And this is, is it's really key, and we interact with APIs all the time. You've probably, if you've seen any of my presentations on uh, some of our systems in the past, we, I think Uber is a really good example. So I'm going to take that example a little further in this. Um, so if you've ever used the Uber app or, or maybe you're holding out and you've not done it yet, either way, you get the idea. You know, you want to order a car to your location to come pick you up and give you a ride, or maybe you did a few months ago anyway. Um, but one of the key things here is, you know, you, you need to show the user's current location on the map. And that's what the Uber mobile app is trying to do. So in order to do that, it's actually going to uh, access multiple APIs from multiple different systems to execute such a such a task. So the first one is that actually, you know, your mobile device itself has an API. And you may have noticed when you install a certain app or application, it may ask you for permission to uh, maybe the, the files on your device to the actual location of your phone. So what it's asking for really is what are your GPS coordinates? So, so the Uber app is gonna take those GPS coordinates from the, your mobile device's API, and then it's gonna also take uh, the Google Maps API. So Google Maps, you know, they've went out and mapped effectively the entire world. It'd be silly for Uber to try to duplicate that when they can use their uh, and license the Google Maps API. Um, so it's gonna say, hey, Google Maps API, I want to know the uh, local map images for these coordinates uh, near my location at these at, at these GPS coordinates. So, so it's using those APIs to stitch together uh, the information it needs in order to execute its processes. So that's kind of an easy example for for our uh, you know daily use of our phones. But you know how do we do this in in lighting? So if you've seen our our if you've explored our APIs for for our intelligent lighting systems. Now here's just some of the typical types of uh, access points you have. Everything from controlling the light output to uh, changing the color temperature of the of the system or controlling that to to seeing system status. Like, hey, is is this group occupied or unoccupied? You know, we can make that accessible in the API, um, and then access sensor data even. So, what's the current light level? What's the temperature? What's the air pressure? As you can imagine, you know, other systems besides the lighting system would find these types of information useful. So a good example here, and one of the biggest applications and lowest hanging fruit we have is within the building automation system. And, and this is, these are systems like Metasys or 
our, uh, tr our train tracer or Honeywell system. So there's a, a whole market of these systems out there that are already installed in our buildings, mainly to operate HVAC systems, um, traditionally anyway, but that's really being expanded. And, and a good example is, is here is, hey, we want to activate the ventilation system in this room when occupancy is detected. And in the HVAC world, that's, that's called demand control ventilation. So as we look at our lighting system API, we want it to tell us, hey, is the occupied status of this room uh, equal to yes? And when it is, I'm going to, building automation system is going to send a command to the HVAC systems API that says, hey, go turn this ventilation system on. So it's then going to, it knows then to activate, maybe open a damper, turn on some ventilation fans, maybe some other commands that it's going to send out. And it's using those APIs to do that. So as you can see, uh, these these are uh, ex exceedingly, um, you know, uh, very expansive systems and, and very uh, widely used for, for a wide variety of applications. Um, so, you know, th these types of concepts apply to all the intelligent lighting products we have from dashboarding to mobile apps to you know, multi-site control of, of your systems uh, to even some of the more technology rich applications like our, you know, dynamic skylighting products, you know, Software is very, very centric to these systems and what they're able to do. And, and being able to do things like the follow the sun uh, type of dynamic lighting experience where we're able to automatically make that product, you know, simulate the look of a natural skylight, that's really all software centric. You know, telling it, hey, dim this panel to this degree and that panel to that degree and, and, and color tune and um, and do all this fancy stuff. You know, that's that's a that's a pretty sophisticated set of you know code or algorithms that really allow that all to come together um, and create such an experience in our building spaces. So um, so so at the end of the day, you know, this can get frustrating. The, all this technology, why why why? Uh, well, there's lots of reasons. You know, there's lots of value we can discern for customers here. And uh, you probably, if you watched the last week's, you saw me pop this uh, up as well. And uh, this is just a really nice snapshot of all the payback drivers that we have from these types of systems. So um, we won't go into these, but but just a, a way to you know summarize it and tie it together. And 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 these are concepts you know we need to be able to understand um, as lighting people, uh, but also increasingly more and more so technology uh, people as we're out advising our customers on on these types of systems and the values they can provide. So. So anyway, that was your uh, quick and dirty intro to uh, software, hardware, and APIs. So uh, thanks, and I'll hand it back to Dwayne. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. So just to remind the, the group, uh, please use the chat box or the Q&A box for questions, and uh, I'll get us started, Chris. I, I know a lot of times we hear the phrase open API. Can you maybe talk about what that is, why it's important? Yeah, so uh, so that's a good question. Um, so open API, you know, as we look at these types of systems, uh, you have, you know, a lot, you know, closed closed systems tend to not allow other systems to integrate with it. And um, versus an open API is is where we would allow a software developer, um, and this doesn't mean just anybody, like everybody in the public, access to this. But but we'd, uh, you know, would allow a partner to actually have access to this, like the SmartCast API, so that they could write a write a software program for, for it. And we've done things like uh, we've used this to do custom dashboards, for example, um, where customers maybe want to, you know, tie the SmartCast lighting system into a dashboard system they already have, so they can see the, the you know, status of the lighting system alongside of maybe their uh, water management system um, to their HVAC system, et cetera. So, um, so having an open API allows us, you know, you know, to work with more uh, more systems. Um, and it really helps us to discern more value as a whole from from these types of systems. And I think that expands, you know, the the people that can kind of participate and drive that value. So I think, you know, create lighting to to kind of create the value around the solutions. You know, I, I, you maybe talk a little bit about that. Sometimes that might be the case, but sometimes it might it might be driven by by a third party um, vendor that's that's has a unique business case that they're interested in, correct? Yeah, that's that's definitely true. Um, you know, and having the APIs is kind of the starting point. You know, we've been talking about it for a few years now and um, have started to find some, some you know, unique use cases for it. So you've got to make that uh, API available in order in order to even, you know, start having that conversation about, you know, hey, what else could we could we do with this type of control and information? 
Yeah, if you want to go back, Chris, to your previous slide, there was a comment about that slide and, and being a great tool for reps to ask designers what trajectory are they on and, and understanding, you know, some of the benefits they could they could get to with, with thinking about some of these things. So like all the presentations we've been doing, they are, the PDF form would be available. Just reach out to uh, uh, whoever you work with in the Creelighting channel. And uh, if you do have access to Creelink, it would, would be available directly there um, as well. I think another thing to kind of remind us of is that we have, you know, access or the ability to create a lot of data and you showed kind of the, the things in trending, right? So we can store it pretty efficiently and economically today. The processing power to effectively and affordably, you know, drill down through the data. Um, but in the end, the, the data still needs to be valuable, right? So I think part of the thing that we need to remind ourselves of is that we need to understand what the customer, who the customer is, what their needs are. The needs of their business and the, and the value that we can drive and, and and there'll be some universal stuff i think that you know the hvac system there's some universal um you know value to that but they'll, they'll probably be also be either unique to industries or specific businesses some some value that uh could be looked at correct yeah that's definitely true you know we are um you know by putting sensors in every fixture and then putting fixtures all over the place with sensors we are starting to generate massive amounts of data and uh we can use that you, you know for Easy tasks like energy reporting or analytics is kind of the the short putt, but you know we've expanded that to space analytics and but there's a variety of other things that that could be done here and I think that's what's going to be really interesting is as we continue to see sensors proliferate around us um you know across all markets, you know how do we continue to leverage that data to to give us better insights and and possibly identify you know one of the big promises here is um, you know, instead of being reactive when a system fails, maybe we could be proactive in identifying a system failure before it even happens. So one example is as, as we start to put temperature sensors in all of our light fixtures, we, we could, you know, in theory, uh, start to analyze uh, or look for temperature anomalies like high temperatures and say, hey, this, this, this fixture is experiencing consistently high heat we know that could cause the LED systems to, to shorten their life. Maybe we should look into that sooner than later uh, to avoid it. So that's, that's kind of an easy example, but you, you know, you could really start to take that to the extreme as we get better at mining that data. And, and this is where systems like artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning can really help us um, in those efforts. Yeah, that's a, a good point. There is a question here, Chris, about do you think that API integration will, will be done locally on a job by job basis, or will it be handled by a, a BAS OEM? Um, so how do, you, how do you see that, or maybe a combination of ways that that might get, get uh, executed? Yeah, I think it really comes down to the specific outcome. Um, so, you know, even as we look at uh, our own software systems, you know, we built the software that works with our own lighting systems using the API. Um, we built the integration with the building automation system using the API. So that's basically a very specific kind of build of the API that is made just to work with the building automation system. And in that scenario, it's definitely the, the integrator uh, is what they call it, um, that's going to be driving that. And I'll say, you know, in, during my experience in the field, it was obvious that, uh, that our, our channel and our agents are increasingly becoming uh, connected with integrators of a variety of types, from mechanical system integrators that focus just on building automation systems, to even uh, technology and AV integrators that are doing, you know, other types of systems we we never really thought we might work with. Um, and then you have your, you know, more custom stuff like direct API integration, where maybe you're tying into a custom software program that maybe a hospital system is using, and that's going to really be, you, you know, more of a a uh, very specific type of um, of a developer that would do that type of thing. So I think the biggest one is the building integrators that that work in that building automation space, and, and I think that's the biggest opportunity for us, at least right out of the gate here. Perfect. All right, Chris, I don't see any other questions. So if you want to advance a couple of slides here, I'll close up shop. All righty. Thanks all. Good questions. Thank you. And I want to thank. Chris, again, for joining us and for creating the, the content uh, for us today. I also want to thank the audience uh, again for joining us. We appreciate um, your attendance uh, each and every session. Looking ahead to next week on Monday, our design session will be around uh, parking lots. We'll look at the recommended par practice around parking lot lighting. The uh, Wednesday industry session, we'll look at LM79 reports. And then next Friday, as Chris mentioned, we'll be looking behind the scenes with building network and networking and controls commissioning. 
Um, again, all of the content is being recorded and made available on our YouTube channel within 24 to 48 hours. So if you've missed a session, please feel to free to catch up there. Uh, we'd love to have you subscribe to that as well. And as always, if there's any feedback you'd like to share uh, with me directly, you can shoot me a note and uh, any of our presenters would also be happy to hear from you directly if you have any uh, additional questions. With that, I do want to thank everybody again for joining us and uh, have a great weekend and take care everybody.